Everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator for the VMFA, and we are thrilled to uh, welcome you to our final installment of the Dirty South Virtual Speaker Series presented by Bank of America. Tonight's program will be a discussion between the exhibition curator, Valerie Cassell Oliver, and one of the catalog essayists, Dr. Fred Moten. So with that, Valerie, I think I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Izzy. And I believe we do have Guthrie Ramsey next Friday. Oh, well, this Friday, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Oh, my yes. goodness. All right. Well, we are certainly rounding the corner here. And uh, it has been uh, a delight. And I think we're ending uh, this virtual speaker series uh, with a bang. But I am just thrilled this evening to welcome you to this um, very spontaneous conversation that um, Fred and I will uh, embark upon a, a sort of journey, if you will. Uh, but before we do, I want to just briefly uh, give you a bit of information about Fred. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in English. Uh, and yet he has been um, uh, such a profound um, contributor in terms of uh, his scholarship. Uh, not only in poetry and English, uh, but also in areas around performance studies, Black aesthetics, and cultural production. Uh, he is, is he uh, mentioned, is a contributor to the catalog, uh, but I came to know him by way of my own research, uh, and I was just um, telling him how instrumental his work uh, in the break uh, which was produced in uh, 2003 as a uh, book around English and performance studies uh, was so, um, so very profoundly uh, inspiring to me um, that in fact he was putting into words and articulating uh, things that I had in my brain, uh, but certainly had no words for. And I found that uh, in his own work and you can see and read so much of what he has produced over the years. Um, he has produced a number of seminal works in the break, something I mentioned um, more recently, uh, Black and Blur. Uh, and then um, a profound um, contribution was uh, the work with um, Stefano Harney entitled The Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study. Uh, he will, uh, as of this year, he and Stefano collaborated again with another uh, work called All Incomplete. So um, he is a professor of performance studies at NYU and continues to shake the ground uh, that we walk upon. And uh, I'm just so honored to be in conversation with him. Um, Fred, would you now join us? We we're just going to have a casual conversation. I really want to uh, bring in his thoughts uh, and expand his thoughts of uh, what he's not only contributed to the catalog, but what he continues to contribute around Black aesthetics and cultural production. So Fred, welcome. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. and. Um, and with everybody, and uh, I've been looking forward to it for a long time. So, well, it's an honor, and I—I I was trying to remember the first uh, project that uh, we may have uh, encountered together. Was it Ben Patterson or? Uh... Yeah, it was. You were um, putting together the catalog for the show, um, 
that you did in Houston on Benjamin Patterson, the great um, Black artist who was such a seminal figure in the Fluxus movement. And, um, and you were kind enough to ask me to contribute something and then even more kind and enough to, to let me be late because <laughs> it, it took me a long time. I, I didn't know a lot about Mr. Patterson before you asked me and I really needed to try to educate myself so I could try to write something, you know, worthy of, or at least make an attempt at writing something worthy of him. And, and over the course of that work, it became clear that uh, for me, it was more than just about writing about him. It, it just opened up a whole new world, a whole new curriculum for me and a, definitely a, a whole, whole new way of thinking about art and black music and opera and uh, so anyway so yeah i don't know if i've ever properly thanked you for for opening that door for me but it it, it, it has meant the world uh to me over the last really over the last 10 years so. oh, well i'm honored and uh it was worth the wait every uh word every period every comma well worth the wait i have uh just been um just so again inspired. And I I was giving Fred flowers earlier and he goes, well, I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation. And honestly, it's more than just being a part of the conversation. It is uh, beautiful that space of transference because you realize even in this exhibition, The Dirty South, um, that that conversation again between sort of black aesthetics and the cultural production however that manifests, right? It can manifest with the sonic, it can manifest in the visual, it can manifest as words uh, spoken, words written, um, but it is all, the source is all there. Um, yeah. Well, it was, uh, <laughs> I was just uh, talking with a couple friends of mine, maybe we we're gonna work on something together. And, um, and today I was, I guess I really like to look up words. You know, I like to look up the, the etymology of words, I like to know where the words come from and what some of the, maybe some of the original meaning of words that, that gets lost or dropped along the way. And yet at the same time, I feel like words still carry the trace of those, those meanings. And, and so the word I was looking up today was, was sumptuary. Um, and, and it's an old word from, when I was in graduate school and when I was sort of studying Renaissance, English Renaissance literature, and they used to have these laws called sumptuary laws, which were really about the laws that had to do with, with personal expenditure, with how people, particularly working people, spent their money. And it was really a way of regulating, making sure that, that, that they didn't have, that first of all, the way that you could make sure that people didn't have very much money to spend was by watching them spend it you know, and by making sure that they didn't spend it in a way that that gave them some kind of an air or gave them some sort of way of rising above their so-called station. Mm -hmm. So the sumptuary laws were about personal expenditure and it, and it was really about food and clothing. It was a way of regulating what people ate and regulating what people wear. And, um, and I guess the reason I'm thinking of this is just because so much of my experience of being in the South and my experience of of aesthetic existence in the South was sort of deeply about what you wore and what you ate. Mm -hmm. And, and even when I listened to music from, from the South and, and when I listen to, when I, when I, when I look at visual art from the South, even in this, in the, in the, in the image we have right here, mm -hmm. it's so much about not just what people wear, not just about how it looks on them, but, but how it feels, how it, how it's draped on their bodies, how, how, it, how it conforms or doesn't conform to their shapes and to their movements. And, um, and so I, I feel like the, the art of the dirty out, South is, is a sumptuary art. You know, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's sensual, but, it's, but even more specifically, it's sumptuary. It's, it's what you eat, what you wear, how it feels. You know? mm -hmm. it's, so, a, it's a thing, it's yeah. a flag. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it's also interesting too how there is a, a kind of uh, 
because economy was not, uh, there, were, there was always a space of economy because of there's a, 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 the space of lack, mm -hmm. what one does not have. And then the, the, the bar in which people make up and surpass that, that bar of lack, right? And yeah. so it was always the, uh, if you couldn't have gold, then you had things that were gold-like, <laughs> you know, you had, and the, 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 the sense of adornment, you know, whether that manifested in your home and what your home looked like, um, or whether that, that a sense of adornment was, was actually wearable art, you know, how you would, again, take something, take that, I, I believe the original Octopovra happened in the, in the dirty South. <laughs> You know, that was the space of art de povra. That was the art of the taking the something and turning it into something else. That was the original. Uh, and I, I, you know, black hands to take uh, the detritus, the, the cast offs, the, uh, the things that were um, not eaten, the things that were not worn uh, or the things that were worn and converting them, transforming from forming them into something completely different. But it's this idea of elongating um, the possibilities in the physical realm, right? I mean, you may not have it, you may not be able to wear gold, but you could wear things that um, that certainly had the air of of um, of expense to it, uh, and it was all about carriage, you know. Um, my mother would always say, you know, money don't buy class. It simply does not. But it, it, there is a kind of style that, that, that style of sensibility that people bring a certain individually uh, kind of proposal, individual proposal to notions of style uh, that, that in some ways make up for what one does not have. You know, it's like a resistance to be, to be relegated. Uh, uh, a resistance of not having in a way. Well, I think, I think that, I guess I feel like maybe there's a couple different ways to look at it, you know, it's like, and I know that it's, there's such a, an extraordinary tradition and it's a time honored tradition of of, of interpreting, you know, black style as a, as a way of, as a way of, well, on the one hand, as a way of, 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 you know, as the old saying goes, make, making a way out of no way or making a way out of making something out of nothing. Um, you know, making, making a kind of, you know, richness out of, out of deprivation. Um, and and I, I mean I I for so long I guess I really thought about it that way myself, mm -hmm. and um, and it really had to do with maybe the ways, not only that let's say you know some kinds of black styles in 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 the South and and when I say South I, you know something we could talk about later but I I'm so much aware that 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 even though we're obviously and and happily and proudly talking about the 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 southern part of you know the north american continent that that when it comes to black style you know the south has always got to be understood as a global phenomenon and so there's ways in which you could feel like and at the same time the south man it, it you know i grew up in in las vegas nevada for the most part which was you know, Nevada was the Mississippi of the North, is what they are. The Mississippi of the West is what right. they called it. And and I was talking with some people last week, some 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 elders and artists from Chicago that you joined us for a little bit last week. And for them to talk about Chicago meant that they were for Val Gray Ward talking about Chicago was impossible without talking about Mound Bio, Mississippi. Oh yeah. You know, and Delta, and you, up south. And, we yeah, say up south. <laughs> up south. Or you think about the ways that Mississippi is, you know, that Chicago is a city in Mississippi and Mississippi is an island in the Caribbean and the Caribbean is an archipelago that broke off from Africa. You know, it's that, that there's these 
these global dislocations that we're that we're part of. But but and within that general field, it feels to me sometimes like on the one hand, it seems totally right to say, yeah, we, we always be making something out of nothing. And we always be revaluing what has been devalued. But then there's another way in which I kind of want to say it wasn't that people were making something out of nothing as much as it was that people were had a much richer understanding of the absolute wealth of nothingness, <laughs> you know, like like. Like one way to put it would just be that it was people working out of this sort of concept that there was nothing that was supposed to be thrown away. Right. You know, that 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 chitlins weren't supposed to be thrown away, that you know, uh, you know, uh field greens weren't supposed to be thrown away, but also people, people weren't supposed to be thrown away. And um and and you know, remnants from fabric weren't supposed to be thrown away. There was nothing nothing was disposable nothing was trash right. everything was well you know everything was everything you know um and it all had to do with it and um mm. and and that's such a an amazing sort of outlook you know on on existence you know that that refusal to throw stuff away to throw anybody away and um and again it feels to me like the 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 exhibit is is just replete with that sense that sensibility that there's that ain't nothing ain't nothing supposed to be thrown away here you know that's so. a, it's a very beautiful way of reframing that and thank you for that because i i agree you know i mean there is this um certainly the the respect and love uh that all things deserve you know, or all things feed into everything else, as you say, you know, the resistance to throwing anything away, uh, things can be recouped. And, mm -hmm. and, and once use retains a certain level of power, a certain residual of what it was, that, yeah. that gives it all the more potency in the thing that it becomes, the next yeah. thing it becomes. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful, I, I'm, I was thinking about, um, uh, Mary Bendorf and how she would talk about making uh, quilts from scraps of clothing, uh, clothes that had been worn and worn out and, you know, ergo, you don't throw it away, mm -hmm. it then gets converted into quilts, which she says, she even speaks about it as retaining the power of the wearer, that mm -hmm. it's replete, it's resonant with the person who wrote it. And you know, my attitude is those quilts in many ways, they were meant to keep you warm, but they were also in many ways talisman, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they were protective. Um, they surrounded you and those spirits and the energies, you know, really. So the space about mysticism, I think is a good place to kind of like insert this idea around mysticism, or mm. maybe it's not so much mysticism, but as you said, just a philosophical way of seeing and moving uh, through the world. Well, the, I think it's I think it's great to it's mystical, but it's physical too. It's right. both. And those those two terms don't don't negate one another. They they augment one another. You know, and um, so when you feel or sense that resonance, you know, of another person of the of the wearer or of the sower or of the knitter, you know, or even of the, of the listener. Um, when you sense that presence, it's because that presence is real. That presence is actually physical. I, <laughs> I've been telling this story a couple of times, so I hope nobody out there has already heard me say it, but it's something that really has weighed on me the last six months or so. I was, I, you know how we were all trying to figure out ways to gather you know since we can't go to church like this you know right. trying to figure out how, how can i get together with my folks you know and so we were i was doing this kind of listening party every once in a while with a couple friends of mine um named hippotia Vorlumas and sandra ruiz and we would we would get together and just listen to music together you know and um and we were listening to Stevie Wonder. They, they, so I think Hippotia played uh, that song called "Love's in Need of Love Today" from from Songs in the Key of Life, mm -hmm. and 
And I was, and we were talking about Stevie. And I remember, you know, it just struck me the the beauty of his name because his mother named him Steveland, S T E V E L A N D. You know, which was, which is a work of art in and of itself. It seems. <laughs> right. And um, and she. And there's if you get if you go and look at your album cover, I guess it's in the CD booklet, too. But if you've got the album from 76, I guess it was, uh -huh. then you can go. There's a booklet that has all the lyrics. And at the end, he writes like a little letter and he actually signs it and he signs his name, Steve you know, Steveland. Uh -huh. And I and I wanted to show it to them. I wanted to show my friends on Zoom, you know, see, that's that's what that's how he wrote, wrote his name. Right. And I opened up the album and I opened up that booklet and all of a sudden I almost fainted because it was my mother's record and it smelled just like my mom in her house. Right. Wow. Yes. And, um, you know, it was there's certain I've had that thing before where like we have a lot of my mom's hats, you know, and some of her sunglasses and different things like that that she loved and and you open up the box and you can get that whiff but with this but i was like man even even her records smell like her you know and i thought that's 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 the relation between the mystical and the physical that you that there is literally you know my mom is physically present in in those records the that 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 she played those records with such a kind of intense devotion that those and and you know, I, I don't think it's an unusual experience. I don't think it's unique. It's it's only worth telling because I imagine everybody here got some story like that, you know. And um, mm -hmm. but and and that's why again, I think it's one way to think about this intensity of the relation between the physical and the mystical is you could kind of think about it almost in a Marxian kind of way that it's it's uh you know Marx or a kind of modified Marxian way like he. He associates fetishization and the fetish character of the commodity with exchange value. But, but what if there's another kind of mystical quality to the to things that really is about not so much how it is exchanged, but how it's used, right? right? right. Um, and and it's it's these things that that you get that you have, and and they they retain their intensity over the course of time, over generations, because of how they were used, you know, and I, 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 I want to believe that that's something a little bit kind of like what what Miss Bendorf is talking about, <laughs> you know, a little bit. So. No, it, it absolutely is that. I mean, and it is about calling, uh, in calling a name. I mean, unfortunately, we that, that moniker, uh, not even a moniker, that statement, that phrasing, is, is used in order to bring to mind and to remembrance those who have passed away violently. Mm -hmm. So we say, say their names, you know? Uh, but we know that from the whole Christian tradition, right? You know, mm -hmm. and it goes even deeper than that. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, mm -hmm. you do these things as a way of recalling and, and in re that recall, you know, uh, manifesting you know, that spirit of that mm -hmm. person or that entity or that thing. Uh, and so th there is something that is very deep, that goes deep. I mean, you know, you could tie it to, again, this sense of mysticism that, that, uh, uh, that married itself with Christianity. Uh, yeah. Well, but speaking things into the cloth is another element, um, you know, a singing uh, into the cloth. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are all elements that give these things a certain kind of resonance, uh, whether they're on the wall, you know, we say, you know, the G's been quilts. I mean, they're so dynamic, visually dynamic. They literally pulsate, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I think there is something to it that when you piece, you piece alone. But when you quilt, at least in that time, people came together to quilt and they spoke over it and they they, you know, children played underneath the saw, the saw horses and they sang songs as they, you know, uh, um, quilted uh, these, these quilts. And so there is that sense of rhythm to it. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're sanctified by, by social presence. And, um, 
and sanctified in the gathering, you know, and, um, you know, and then they're infused, you know, with the spirit of that gathering, but the spirit is material. It's, it's actual breath. It's actual words to people saying sounds that they're making, um, you know, the smell of whatever is cooking, you know, back in the kitchen, <laughs> you know, all of those things, all of those things are, are palpable, you know, um, and really it's just a matter of, now the interesting thing is that the palpability of those things can be removed from us if, if to the extent that those objects are, 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 are sort of ceremonialized out of our everyday connection to them, you know? Um, and, and sometimes we do that because they, they're so beautiful, you know, and you, you want to preserve them, you know, and you want to save things. But, but then there's this other part of it, which is like, but, but, but the preservation doesn't, the preservation of what's material, what's, what's essential to those things is a preservation that is only given by way of their use. Right. And, and their use is the use of those things is 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 also necessarily the, the the transformation of those things or even the decay of, of those things you know I, this is for me a I feel like this is something that I really have had to begin to try to understand and think about in relation to Thornton Dial's work you know um, which is not only because of the ways he would do this study first of all because he didn't throw nothing away <laughs> you know nothing was trash everything was used and used again and then at the same time even even including carcasses animal carcasses you know so, and you just think so he's literally he's folding decay into the work you know and i think it's meant to suggest that that this work is also meant to decay that it's meant to be used it's meant to be touched even you know and 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 if you think about that with regard to the quilt, you know, um, in other words, that that the that to, to to recognize the intensity of the quilt, to recognize the beauty of the quilt, it's not so much that yeah, it's just to keep you warm, but it's also that in the very fact of it's keeping you warm, right. your skin, right. your breath now becomes part of the quilt, and as it's passed down, and and that and the passing down of it is 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 also the the long slow transformation and even decay of it in the use of it you know and it it's a fundamentally different sensibility about about aesthetic life you know that this is stuff to be used right. you know rather than stuff to be saved rather than anything to be frozen you know and um you know and it's it's a it's a it's it's interesting. It's deep how it is that 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 activating the transformation of a thing, that activating the decay of a thing, is actually in a way a much more faithful attitude towards it. You know, um, you know, use it, use it. You know, it's there to be used. Well, it's interesting, and and of course it poses real issues uh, when you are actually in a museum. You know, yeah. I mean, where where that schism comes together where there is a, I mean, I had a conversation recently about, uh, because we are now having so, uh, so many more objects, uh, such as the quilts of G's Ben, and, you know, I, I, I sort of refrain from calling them folk art, because I think that's been a way to uh, um, relegate them to the margins. And I, I like to think of them as uh, um, a, a espousing a certain level of, of intellect that these artists have brought to bear um, with the, the creation of the work, you know, however intuitive, there is an intellectual element to it. Um, but the thing that we're facing, of course, is that now this is in the holdings of an institution and, and an institution which its whole being is about the preservation of objects. Uh, it was, um, we had, um, a work by Jenny Petway, which was created in the uh, 1940s that was on view and it had a stain on it, uh, it was a quilt. And I remember uh, giving a tour uh, through the, the galleries and someone looked at it and said, 
there's a stain on that. And I go, yeah, of course there's a stain on it. It was used, you know, and it was like yeah. this idea was, well, why wouldn't you not remove that stain before putting it up on view? And it's like, but it is what it is. I mean, yeah. that, that, that is mark making. That is, that, that is the mark making of life, you know, and that yeah. it's supposed to be, it completes this work to remove it would be the same as, you know, walking up to a painting and literally taking, you know, some turpentine and removing a little aspect of it. That, that mm. it, it is, that is what gives it power is that stain <laughs> sitting exactly where it's sitting. Uh, and it also makes me think of uh, another artist who's featured in the exhibition, although it's not uh, the piece, uh, Rodney Macmillan, who would go in and take you know, uh, pieces of carpet that would uh, come up out of the, the floor of an office or out of a home and uh, where there's certain spaces of, of movement, you know, walking through the hallway where it was the, the pile had been run down or where it was pristine because there was a piece of furniture over the carpet. But mm -hmm. all of that mark making of life uh, and, and really codifying that or, or framing it in the language of painting, uh, which I found so uh, profound. But, you know, I, I thought what was really interesting is how you have this beautiful tri triangulation of, of uh, a place in the sense that um, in Thornton Dow coming out of Bessemer, Alabama, even though he wasn't born there, but uh, certainly raised in Bessemer, Alabama and lived his life there, mm -hmm. uh, Sun Ra, coming out of that same area. Jack Witten coming out of that same area. And to me, that kind of, um, that, that power of that triangulation of someone working as uh, an artist who had been trained through the academy, but mm -hmm. also insisted, insisted on this notion of being connected to the earth, being connected to the South in such a profound way. Although people don't talk about Jack Witten as being from the South. Uh, of course, Thornton Dahl, and then of course, Sun Ra. I mean, when you talk about throwing nothing away, the sort of perpetual uh, energy of objects, however, however they transform, I mean, that is certainly Sun Ra's realm. Well, somebody, I was going to say somebody should write a book about Bessemer, um, but there are books about Bessemer um, and about Birmingham and those environs. And, I'm thinking of a couple. One is, you know, Robin Kelly's great book, Hammer and Ho, about, you know, black steel workers and communist organizers in, in Alabama in the, in the, in the 30s, and 40s. And this just rich tradition of, of radical labor organizing that black folks did in Bessemer and, and continues today yeah. insofar as Bessemer is, you know, the hotbed of resistance to, to Amazon and you know, Bezos's, you know, predatory modes of, of, you know, profit for profiteering, but, but also the, the great, great literary critic um, who teaches at University of Virginia, Deborah, De Deborah McDowell, wrote a wonderful book, a memoir about growing up in Bessemer called um, Le Leaving Pipe Shop, you know, and um, anything about her being from there, you know, Angela Davis being from Burma, you know, it's like uh, yeah. something was going on down there, obviously, <laughs> you know, something was going on. Um, maybe like Sun Ra says, there was just some general pipeline from, from, from Bessemer straight to Saturn that was generating all kind of, all kind of, all kind of deep stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, and, and yeah, and to think about Witten, you know, w one way to think about it is that, you know, with, with Dial and Witten especially, they were, well, I was talking to a, a friend of mine named Greg Borderwitz, who's a great artist and who's also was a great friend of Jack Witten later in, 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 in Witten's life. And, and he talked about going to Witten's studio and it was like going to the garage, you know, it was like a mechanic, you know, because <laughs> okay. he was really, because on the most basic level, he he seems to have just been absolutely fascinated with what it meant to apply pigment to a surface. And then on a secondary level, what it meant when the pigment itself became a surface that could then be manipulated and have things further applied to it. So 
So at a certain point, it wasn't even about brushwork anymore. It was about cutting and gouging and, yeah. and layering and building. And when you think about that, you think, well, there's so much of a connection between what he was doing and what and what Dial is doing, but what he was doing and what the, the women in G's band were doing. And it's really this, you know, there's this intense kind of sense of people just sort of they're, they're, they're figuring out in all of these intense ways what how to how to put stuff together i guess is the best way to put it yeah. you know they're they're really interested in in the in the in the mechanics and in, in what i would call like you know what somebody might call the the social mechanics of how stuff goes together on on a canvas in a yard you know the yard art it, it, it was just like there was just this constant experimentation in putting stuff together um, really, to be perfectly honest, there's a technical term for it that I that I have to use, and I apologize if anybody gets their feelings hurt by me. Because, but it's a it's really they were these people were constantly interested in the mechanics of how shit go together. You know, and, as simple as that. Yeah, <laughs> and as that. You know, and it's um and it's a, it's it's this constant aesthetic experiment, which is also at the same time. A constant social experiment, um, and it it it's about, uh, and it could be about putting your outfit together. It could be about putting the quilt together. It could be about digging a barbecue pit. It could be about, you know, getting 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 folks to church. You know, it was always this this constant attention to that. And what I mean to say is, it's a constant attention to that which does not admit of anything more important than that, right. okay? Like, <laughs> like, it's the way you pay attention to a thing when you know that there's no nothing more important than that thing, right? Ain't nothing more important than how we get together today, right? you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, look, it's the only way we could ever, it's, it's the only way Black folks in this could ever survive. Right. It's it's the condition of possibility of our survival, you know, in a in a brutal, in a brutal world. Um, you know, and um, you know, and it's and it's basically the only, the only it, it remains, you know, the only hope we got. And and what that means is complicated, right? Because because on the one hand, I don't believe that the natural habitat of this stuff is the museum. No. Like it, there's some fundamentally it's some it's a very it seems to be true in a deep and fundamental way that none of this stuff is supposed to be in the museum and yet what it is what what the the idea of losing this stuff yeah insofar as what it is that we do and what our and our practices are under such constant duress such constant brutal violent duress the idea of losing this stuff is unbearable because because it's our only hope so that's the the dialectic, right? Um, but I, you know, you for know. me, I think there are a couple of things. You know, I I I think about this notion about the hyper regenerative nature of things, um, how keloids come about, and how one can apply that culturally, right? There, it's there. There is a refusal to be static. There has to be a constant movement. And so even though objects are maybe brought into an institution, we know that it, th these sort of aesthetics continue to evolve. And what comes out of that, uh, those traditions continue to evolve and they, and they produce, the cultural production is ongoing, mm -hmm. ongoing. That's why I thought it was important to have a Thornton dial and a slab. <laughs> in this oh no, it, it's, you know? it's and, absolutely, and, and, and please don't, don't, don't let me don't let me be imprecise and make it seem like I'm saying the wrong thing. I, it's indispensable what you're doing. It, this is, but this is the contradiction that we live, right? And and as my old you know teacher, you know, and mentor Cedric Robinson used to say, at this stage of the game, we have to heighten those contradictions. I mean, he sometimes he would say heighten the contradictions, and sometimes he would say deepen the contradictions, and. Somehow we have to heighten them and deepen them at the same time because um, 
you know, because yeah, I mean, you know, this 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 interplay between preservation and and destruction, you know, is it's like right. that's that's our purview now. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. right. And I, I started telling the story, and then I I went off on another tangent. But yes, there was a conversation about a particular artist in the work. And, you know, uh, thankfully the show is traveling and it's going to several venues. And there was this, this kind of back and forth with one of the conservators. And the idea is that they wanted to create this apparatus to put this piece in and it needed this and it needed that to ensure its safety and to ensure it was uh, preserved. And, you know, my, my, I just started laughing. I said, you know, this was, this was uh, hung to a nail on a wall in an alley. <laughs> You know, back in 1970, and it was fine. <laughs> it was yeah. so fine. You know, uh, you know, somehow, as you say, to kind of, there was a desire to almost kind of create a sterile environment. And I said, if you create that sterile environment, you take away the power of this piece. This piece is meant to exude power, and and it is seen in the roughness, in the in the the way that it is cobbled together, the way that is precarious. You know that is the power, that precarious nature of its own existence, which I think you really get into when you're writing uh, about the precarious nature of blackness. You know, and our existence. That uh, I love this piece uh, from Black and Blur, uh, the section called "Remind." You know, and that this need to be reminded no matter where you are and what you're doing and, and what status you may arrive at, that the, this notion of blackness is constantly uh, putting people in remembrance and, and they putting us in remembrance of, of who we are and where we come from and where we constantly have to resist going back to. Yeah, no, we can't forget. Well, it kind of goes back to what you were saying about you know, say say her name, and I was thinking, <laughs> may you remind me of two great Southern musical acts. You know, um, you know, Destiny's Child from Houston. You know, <laughs> right. say my name, but then also Bobby Bland had his great song. You know, Bobby Bland from Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. who also had his own. A lot of kind of interesting musical connections to Houston, you know, when he was recording for for Duke Records in Texas in the in the sixties. But but he <laughs> he had his song called Little Boy Blue, you know, and it was all and at the end of the song, it's just this crescendo, you know. She used to call me Bobby. <laughs> she called me Bob, you know, and it was like um, that that what you know it's it's a uh, that that's that that naming that which is a that that reminding that yeah. that rememory you know as as Morrison might say you know um, that's a that's a crucial part of this um, you know that's a crucial part of this you know S sister sister Gertrude would, would would tell us so you know and um, yeah I mean it's uh it's you know, again, I, I, I was really reminded of this so much with such intensity this last couple of weeks doing this thing that was organized by, you know, our mutual friend, the, the great Romy Crawford, the Black Arts School um, modality that we had for two weeks. And it was really just, you realize the intensity and the necessity of, of a kind of orality of, of and a, a huge part of the week, those two weeks was people saying, was people saying names, people remembering folks saying, and another person y'all need to know about is this, you know, but not even just names, but addresses. Yeah. And then we were at, you know, um, and we started this at, you know, I don't know, 1432, 84th place, you know, it was those kind of, yeah, we really, it, it, it uh, I mean, so much of my life grew up, I mean, I, I think about it in terms of addresses, you know, my, my mom's best friends are QB and Eloise Bush, 1948 North D Street, you know, the and like the back of your oh head. man, oh man, you know, it, it's, um, that was, you know, I didn't get, 
<laughs> what happened in Berkeley really wasn't all that deep. You know, school for me was 1948 North D Street. Nice. Um, nice. That was, you know, and, and but but everybody has these names and, and addresses and, and places, you know, and um, and, you know, and the show is beautiful because it, it 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 reminds us, it helps us to to remember. You know, so. Well, you know, I, I think we're I mean, do you want to talk? I don't want to go too much down a rabbit hole about talking about the essay because we're already at seven. Uh, with 15 minutes uh, prior to sort of wrapping things up. And I know there were a couple of questions here. I'm wondering if we should, uh, if we should maybe look uh, at what they're, they're saying. Yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, someone is, uh, I think people have really gotten stuck quite honestly, even though the show, uh, the exhibit itself uh, has such a wide, um, uh, breath to it, I think people really fixate on this notion of dirty mm -hmm. in the dirty South. Uh, and so there's I have two questions, both of them somewhat point to the same notion about the dirty South. Uh, so I, I always find that very interesting that the fixation is on the dirt and the dirty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and it dovetails nicely. Uh, I said, we, we shouldn't really get into the essay, but you do talk about the dirty South. Uh, that is a big part of the, the, the contribution, uh, here in written form. Well, I mean, well, you should say something about what, <laughs> what you were doing. You, you chose the term, but. I did. I did. No. I mean, and I, I mean, it, 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 for me before I, you're right. I'm not putting mm. you in the, the line of fire at all. I mean, for me, uh, someone was talking about, you were saying about the, uh, uh, the etymology of words and what did you, it's, it, if you looked up dirty and what was that? So that, that yeah. was the, uh, that was the sort of opener, but yes, I mean the dirt and dirty, of course, we can look at the dirty South from a myriad of, of, of ways. It's not, fixed, um, but uh, one can allude to the Aquarian society, the Aquarian mm -hmm. society that the South rose from, and one can allude to the, the socio-political <laughs> historical framing of mm -hmm. what it meant to rise a whole economy from the South based on labor. And then uh, all of the sort of laws that ensured that that labor would remain free labor uh, and the sort of residuals uh, that we're still contending with today. So, you know, it gets codified clearly in the, the 1990s uh, with the whole rise of, of Southern hip hop. Uh, and in their framing, it alludes to all of those things. It alludes to the history of the South. Uh, it alludes to the fact that there are still uh, connections to the land. Uh, there's still connections uh, that the, all of the things that the land brings forth. And there is a space of, of uh, mysticism and spirituality that comes out of that. Um, there's the, the, again, the physicality of space and, and land that one traverses and where one is sighted uh, as a community, uh, it, it is all in there. It's all facets of uh, the history and the culture uh, and the presence of, uh, of, of, of people in the African-American South and beyond. So, I mean, we can extend that to a global South as we were even talking before. But yes, the dirty South itself is, is really born of that. Well, it you know, if you could, the, the, the etymology of dirty is tricky. It's kind of like a, it's a false, it's a, it's misleading in a sense, because if you, if you, if you, if you leave it just there, then what you're already operating under the assumption of is that there's something filthy or nasty or lesser about dirt. Mm -hmm. And obviously dirt has a certain relation to excrement. To, to filth, to shit, you know, but, el but dirt is also bound up with earth, right? But if you've already got a kind of sense of the earth itself as being dirty, lowly, I mean, we, we think about it, you know, in a different way, you know, if you think about Zora Neale Hurston, you know, and the, the, you know, the greatest novel written, you know, 
to me, in my mind on this continent is 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 their eyes are watching God and 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 the the highest point, so to speak, of social existence that their eyes are watching God portrays is life in the muck, right? In the in the Everglades and that that common social and aesthetic life that the T Cake and Janie lived there for a little while. And um, you know, look, I mean, the, ain't nothing wrong with dirt. You know, if you think about again, somebody from another great artist from up south Chicago, Curtis Mayfield. Um, you know, maybe to me, my favorite song of his is We're a Winner. And there's a great line from We're a Winner, you know, the uh, couplet, you know, uh, we're, we're living proof that all's alert because we're two from the good black dirt. That's right. Now, sometimes when he says it, it's, I think sometimes he says good black dirt, and I think sometimes he says good black earth. But but the point but the point is the goodness of it as well as the blackness of it. So he's not assuming that there's something wrong with dirt, <laughs> right? And and obviously yeah, dirt includes excrement. You know it. You know there's there's a there's a very simple question of cultivation and fertilization. You know the 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 shit is you know that's how come in in a black vernacular the shit is something that's also good. You know which is to say that something that's good is also you know, we have enough, you know, lexical flexibility to talk about something good as that which is bad. Okay. So, you know, we, you know, we, we, we deal, you know, on an everyday level, on an everyday vernacular level with these, with these, you know, realms of, of richness and, 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 and complexity. So the dirt is, is more complicated than just, you know, the way in which the, the normative etymology of it wants to set it up, you know, and, um, Right. You know, as opposed to, you know, Shakespeare, whom I love, you know, but 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 Prospero's slur, one of his most memorable slurs for Caliban is when he simply calls him thou earth. Right. As if to call somebody earth is the worst possible thing that they could be. Well, that's a you know, that's a problematic attitude that we would that we refuse. And um yeah, it reminds me of my old teacher, me and Stefano's old teacher in college, Martin Kilson, who always used to, who taught us about black politics in, 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 in the United States, but also in, in Africa and the Caribbean. And, but the way he would, he would always describe the South as the funky South, <laughs> you know? And um, so whenever I, when I read the dirty South, I always hear the funky South too. And again, funk is, funk, funk, Funk works in a very similar way. Um, well, it brings so. a whole different dimension to it. And, and the yeah. space of the earth and the dirt as a space of nourishment, as a space in which things grow from, yeah. uh, and as a source, you know, and that is an argument that I like to make is that the South is a source. It is a source of so many things. It is a source, it's contested ground even now socially, politically, because it is a source, you know? And I, I think we need to be about recognizing that. I love this image of, of, um, of, uh, of this, um, oh my God, why is his name just went? Freeman Vines, um, who is really, he was a guitar maker out of North Carolina, who is literally embedding these instruments in the earth, in the soil, in the dirt because it is a source of power, it is a source of history, and connecting that, that all that is underneath, all that makes that soil, all that makes that dirt nourishing, connecting that between having that, that, that bridge, if you will, between that earth and, and uh, the people who would pick up this, this guitar so that it's resonant, that it has the energy mm -hmm. of that source. And I think people forget that it is a source. It is a source. I, you know, the argument for me is that modernism doesn't all come from Europe. Modernism comes from our own backyard. Modernism comes from the dirt of the South. And I think we need to be about recognizing it as a source, a continued source that fuels and feeds us aesthetically, uh, that fuels and feeds us physically. Um, and so I, I don't see anything of that by, of connecting dirty with something bad. 
uh, that was never the, the conversation for me in this project at all. Um, uh, 30's, 30's not bad. 30's, 30's bad. Man, that's right. <laughs> You're taking it to the next level, exactly. Um, so I, um, so do you want to, I think those were the only two kind of questions or comments that were given. Do you want to talk a bit about your, your uh, because you do entitle your essay in this book, um, uh, a poem for black art, uh, but it starts with Dirty South, the first uh, line. Well, I was just trying to, I guess part of what I was trying to do, um, you know, just given the stuff that I've been thinking about and teaching the last few years is, is I wanted to understand the dirty. Well, one way to think about it, I guess the, my, I, my mother grew up in a town called Kingsland, Arkansas, mm. which, uh, which appears a little bit in, in the poem. Um, birthplace of Johnny Cash. Um, and my, um, you know, my mother and my grandmother picked cotton on Johnny Cash's uncle's farm, mm. Dave Cash, you know. Um, we used to drive past that, that farm and the fields where they would work, you know when we would go home and stuff. And um, I guess what I was thinking was like, the thing they told us, the, the neighborhood, I mean, it's a town of 300 people, but they were two very distinct black neighborhoods, one called Bear State mm -hmm. um, and another called QB. And it turns out that in the neighborhood that my grandmother and my grandfather lived in and where my mom grew up was QB. It turned out that it was my, my mother's uncle, her, her great uncle, Eli, Eli Mott, who named QB, QB. And he, uh, <laughs> he was a Garveyite, okay? Uh. Um, he, 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 he was an absolute devotee of Marcus Garvey. Um, th this evidently ridiculously mean little man who would stand out in front of the church, in front of the sanctified church, and holler at the preachers and at the sisters going into church about how ignorant they were doing all that shouting and all this kind of stuff, you know. But he, in his, his, but he called, the reason that he called our neighborhood, that neighborhood QB, is because that was all the, that was where all the gambling and the fighting went on. And, and so QB was for Cuba, ah, right? So, and that, that was kind of the inspiration for what I wrote because I was thinking to myself, well, what's the relation between the South that I call home, that I think of as home, the Southern so-called United States and this global South, you know? And I, I had an occasion to visit Columbia, um, you know, a, a few months before I started working on that piece. And it was very, I, I just so deeply recognized you know, my folks when I was there in, in this town called Buenaventura, Colombia on the Pacific coast, which is really an, an all but all black city in Colombia that, uh, you know, under, and the people living there under tremendous duress and at the same time, very much involved in these radical movements and in, in a, in a general strike to, to reconfigure their, their lives against the, the grain of the brutality of the state of Colombia, which, was enabled in its brutality by the United States. And so I was just thinking, well, what's the relation between the global South and my and my South? You know, what's what I need to always be thinking about the relation between QB and Cuba, you know, between between Trinidad and, and Mississippi, between Haiti and 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 you know Alabama. And I and I wanted the poem to be about that, you know, and um I wanted it to be about that while at the same time, very much still informed by, by the South that I do to the extent that I know it, to know anything, that's, that's what I know. So that's, that's part of it. Um, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, it was, and, and, and like I said, the, the occasion that you made for us to be able to think about this is, is very powerful and, and very beautiful. So I was, 
very glad to have been invited to try to contribute so well it it, it is a wonderful contribution someone asked uh, what publication of which i was speaking um it is currently out, uh, The Dirty South, the catalog for the exhibition, uh, which Fred was uh, one of the contributors. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a beautiful way of, I think, sort of uh, bringing a sort of um, pause to the conversation, which I am hopeful will continue uh, on and on, which is this notion of no matter where you are, there you are. You know, no matter where you go, there you are, I believe is the right one, you know, yeah. and always bringing a reference that um, there are many things that uh, unite us across the globe. And certainly those were, uh, were linkages that we've been searching for and looking for and developing, uh, sometimes losing, but, but picking back up again over the course of our time in these United States of reaching out um, to uh, communities uh, that, that look like us, feel like us, are us uh, elsewhere in the world. And so this is but one, one uh, connection in that, uh, your contribution, but I love how you so weave it from the local to the global, if you will, in terms of that, that Southerness. Um, so I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful for this conversation, Fred, and uh, it's a wonderful way of, of, of sort of ending the series. Uh, we'll, we'll do it again, I'm hopeful, on another project at another time, but I'm so grateful for you. Well, I'm thankful for you, too. I appreciate it. Thank you, Valerie. Well, thank you both so much, Valerie, Fred, for this wonderful discussion. All right, everybody, thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you.